Our next presentation is on endovascular treatment of uh, uh, other pathology other than aneurysms and dissections. And uh, uh, we're privileged to have here Dr. Uh, Fred Weaver, who is professor of surgery and chief of the division of uh, vascular and endovascular uh, surgery at uh, our uh, friendly institution, USC. So I've got uh, a fairly large topic, so I'm going to move relatively quickly through it. Just my uh, conflict of interest. So we're going to talk about other aortic pathology, and I'm going to focus on three areas, penetrating aortic ulcer, an intramural hematoma, uh, blunt aortic injury, and then um, aortic infections and the endovascular management of that. So first of all, uh, penetrating aortic ulcer, this is kind of a, a, an unknown uh, to, uh, for us with regards to actually the natural history, the indications for treatment. Um, we really don't have a good handle on patients with this problem. And for vascular surgeons who haven't dealt with uh, much of the thoracic aorta uh, in their earlier practice before the endovascular um, uh, era, uh, the, these ulcers are a, kind of a unique uh, pathology and different pathology for us to take care of. Um, and this is a study from Penn looking at 300 CT scans and then subsequent follow-up CT scans to try to provide some guidance with regards to uh, the treatment of, of uh, penetrating aortic ulcers and intramural hematomas. Um, and uh, I'd like to bring your attention to the fact that as far as the penetrating aortic ulcer for the males, um, that they have a, a, a lesser incidence of actually intramural hematoma than females. Um, uh, and uh, are more, more often uh, isolated or with saccular aneurysms, uh, and that the symptomatic patients are the ones that progress, which obviously makes sense, but isn't very helpful with regards to sorting out which asymptomatic patients we actually ought to uh, take care of. And this is just a typical picture of a penetrating aortic ulcer with uh, some surrounding hematoma. Uh, there's actually uh, three, this, this, this kind of uh, CT or angiographic picture can actually occur in three different kinds of uh, uh, pathology. One is actually a pseudoaneurysm of a branch uh, of, the, of the aorta. One is a recanalization of an existing thrombus, and one is an actual penetrating uh, atherosclerotic ulcer into existing thrombus within the aortic wall. Uh, now the natural history uh, is shown here, and uh, as you can see, the ones with uh, uh, PAUs with intra, uh, intramural hematoma are more likely to be in the descending thoracic aorta uh, by a large mar margin, and you'll see that the intramural hematoma being associated uh, with the PAU is really the bad actor uh, uh, in this particular pathology. Um, symptomatic patients do progress, and they are the ones that are most likely uh, to rupture uh, and present uh, in extremis. Uh, all the other types of Predictors that they looked at uh, in this particular uh, series did not uh, provide any uh, significant uh, differentiation with regards to the decision uh, to perform uh, a repair. Now, uh, intramural hematoma actually is the one where we really need to be paying attention if associated with a penetrating aortic ulcer. Uh, this is a study out of Michigan looking at that, and as you can see, uh, the uh, the, the natural history of just a pure penetrating aortic ulcer versus one that's associated uh, with intramural hematoma is uh, uh, significantly different. And uh, our European colleagues put together an interdisciplinary uh, a panel to try to sort this out. Uh, and they, uh, they, they found with high-risk fe features uh, for the type B uh, intramural uh, hematomas is based on the literature review age greater than 70, an initial diame di aortic diameter greater than 45, uh, a, a growth of greater than 5 millimeters, wall thickness, uh, aortic ulcer presence, and ulcer-like projections. And when they looked at um, the, uh, the just pure penetrating aortic ulcer, symptomatic patients, asymptomatic patients with a pleural effusion or an intramural hematoma, or uh, an initial uh, deep uh, penetrating aortic ulcer, are also candidates uh, for uh, repair. Uh, this is just uh, one patient taken care of at our own institution. I think all of us would probably uh, uh, intervene on a patient such as this that presented with chest pain, uh, large uh, penetrating aortic ulcer with a significant intramural hematoma surrounding it. 
Um, when you're doing case planning with regards to uh, doing thoracic endovascular repair for this, uh, you have to keep in mind that those patients with an intramural hematoma do have a higher secondary intervention rate, so surveillance is very, very important. Um, careful inspection of the entire descending thoracic aorta is required really to de determine the true stent of the disease and really to identify quote unquote healthy proximal and distal landing zones. And incising cri criteria should follow the, the device uh, IFUs. Um, when in doubt, choose the larger of the uh, available devices. Uh, this is our series uh, that we put together about uh, three or four years ago looking at 18 uh, patients with uh, this particular problem. Uh, these are the, um, oh, shoot. Uh, these are the, uh, the uh, indications, and as you can see, uh, basically all patients were symptomatic. Uh, we did have uh, three contained ruptures. Um, uh, we did cover the left subclavian in one patient without revascularization, and three, uh, we, we, we covered the left subclavian with a carotid uh, uh, subclavian transposition. Uh, our, mor our mortality, uh, in-hospital mortality, n no patient uh, died in hospital. We did have some in-hospital morbidity, uh, pleural fusion and chest tube management, and just management of the, the effusion is often a, a significant issue with these patients that present with some uh, actual bleeding. Um, and then they can have pulmonary uh, issues as well as neurologic issues. We had one patient with a retrograde dissection that required an intervention. Uh, at follow-up, we had uh, one patient uh, that did uh, die from a, from a massive hemoptysis and an aortotracheal fistula, um, and the other uh, reasons for mortality were uh, not related uh, to the penetrating ulcer, but is really kind of part of the patient population that does develop a penetrating ulcer. And on follow-up, uh, T-bar was really quite effective uh, in uh, treating uh, these ulcers with uh, resolution uh, of the ulcer as well as uh, the surrounding hematoma. Um, the late outcomes of, of these was looked at uh, by, again, by Michigan, uh, uh, Michael Deeb and his group there. Uh, and this is just the median survival of this cohort of patients uh, uh, during follow-up. And as you can see, the median survival is about 50%. So it's a high-risk patient population that developed, that developed these uh, the problems. Um, it, whether they were treated with open repair or T-VAR, really there was no difference in survival. Uh, and again, uh, the patients that had an associated intramural hematoma were the bad actors. Uh, if you had an isolated penetrating ulcer and you were treated with just a T-bar uh, as compared to um, open repair, there was really uh, no difference uh, in uh, aortic freedom from aortic rupture or subsequent uh, reintervention. But it, interestingly, for those patients with an intramural hematoma that actually did have open repair, they did better in the long term. Uh, than patients that underwent T-VAR simply because the re-intervention rate for T-VAR is higher. Uh, again, uh, suggesting that the surveillance is really, really important in these patients uh, when treated. And this is just from, and this is in your syllabus and, and you can refer to it, but it gives you uh, basically uh, the uh, management algorithm uh, that one might uh, want to refer to when trying to make a decision uh, uh, to proceed with uh, repair, but in general, Obviously, symptomatic patients should be repaired. In patients with associated intramural hematoma, there should be a very low threshold uh, for uh, repair. And given this patient population, uh, thoracic endovascular repair is really the preferred technique. Now, we'll move to blunt aortic injury. Uh, this, is a, this is something that our institution has been interested uh, in a long time. And, and you know, it's a deceleration injury, uh, uh, trauma, uh, with the torsion of these, uh, of the, of the, uh, ascending aorta, and more specifically, the descending aorta that leads to these tears uh, in, uh, in, in, and uh, bleeding and uh, sometimes, and oftentimes, death, uh, particularly before they get to the hospital. Uh, this is a classic paper from Parmley in 1958 looking at patients that had blunt aortic injuries, and the steady uh, uh, mortality rate that occurs if not treated uh, or recognized. Um, there are patients, and we all see them in our practice, that come 20 years later with what looks like they had a blunt aortic injury. They have a history of a car accident, it was not detected, and they have a, a false aneurysm or a healed um, uh, injury in the descending thoracic aorta, but these are the exception and not the rule. So these patients need to be recognized and treated. Um, one of the contributions I think that our institution has made, uh, Dr. Stiles and Dr. Yellen, 
1985, uh, made the observation that you did not need to urgently, emergently rush these patients to the operating room for repair. Uh, they sent, it is, it's in, this is a quote from the paper that they simply had confidence in the adventitia and saw no reason to change their mind about that, that the adventitia would actually control the bleeding. And subsequently, uh, what has evolved over the course of time uh, in treating these patients, it's exactly, exactly the correct approach. Uh, in fact, uh, looking at the Utah Trauma Registry at 145 repairs, the only significant factor in improvement of survival was delaying the repair to a more elective uh, a time frame in it dealing with the other associated injuries that occur uh, in the trauma patient. Uh, Ali Azadeh and uh, Ben Starnes have written a lot about this. This is the classification from Ben Taub. Uh, grade one injury does not require repair, it can simply be observed. Grade two injuries with an associated uh, uh, hematoma should be uh, repaired. Grade three with a complete disruption should re be repaired. In grade four, basically most of these patients do not make it to the, uh, to the hospital, and if they do make it to the hospital, their mortality is virtually 100%. And Ben Starnes' recommendation with regards to this is that you don't really even deal with it, uh, simply because it's futile therapy. Patient selection is important. Uh, it's one thing, one thing to remember that these, this aorta is different than the uh, aorta that uh, we find in the, in the 60 to 70 to 80 year old patient. They have a smaller diameter. They have a tighter uh, ra uh, cur curvature of the radius. Um, and so in sizing and in using devices, it's very important to take that into consideration. Uh, the degree of hypotension is important because a CT scan may be very misleading with regards to sizing. Uh, of the aorta, so IVUS is important to use in these patients uh, at the time of repair. Uh, the devices are much better now, and I don't know if this projects well, but you know, there's a little bird beaking here, which is uh, basically an offset of that uh, on the inner radius of the aorta of the device. And uh, uh, early on in the experience uh, with these repairs, uh, this led to collapse of the endograft and complete occlusion of the thoracic aorta, which is uh, obviously not a good thing. The devices are much better at this point, much more conformable, uh, and do take that curve uh, 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 in a much better fashion. And also we have sizes now that are appropriate for the younger uh, patient. This is from the Gore trial, uh, looking at blunt aortic injury, really superb results. And actually it's a very important trial in a sense that it was the first really prospective um, uh, uh, analysis of uh, the treatment of, of blunt aortic injuries uh, with uh, endovascular device. High technical success, procedural survival of 100%, uh, really mortality occurred uh, in patients from, from existing other injuries, not the aortic injury. You can see that the uh, left subclavian uh, only required uh, uh, coverage in a minority, in, 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 a, in a majority of patients, but uh, Revascularization was very, very uncommon, and I think that is uh, 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 the uh, kind of the standard uh, approach at this point in this particular patient population. Uh, all cause mortality was 7.8%, uh, and uh, they had no major device events and uh, very few key adverse events, and again, no mortality secondary to the aortic injury, which is remarkable. This is from the TransFix trial uh, uh, from uh, Cook. And again, similar, uh, similar uh, kinds of results with uh, three deaths, all of which were related to the, to the traumatic injury, not to the actual aortic injury. And you can see just superb results with regards to uh, uh, the treatment of the aortic injury. And this is just one patient that we had early on uh, with this uh, grade three uh, injury treated, and then with 26 months uh, follow-up, a really nice result with complete resolution and healing of that uh, aortic injury. So blunt aortic injuries really, the, the, the management has really changed. Uh, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but obviously CT scan screening uh, is, uh, is, is key. Uh, it's replaced diagnostic angio uh, completely. IVUS is very, very important uh, in managing these patients when you do the repair. The repair should be delayed until the uh, till the hemodynamics uh, uh, of the patient and other associated injuries are dealt with. Um, Non-operative management of selected cases, grade one, and uh, you know, this is controversial, but uh, the ruptured grade, grade four, but twos and threes do need to repair an endovascular repair. This major improvement in survival as well as the incidence of paraplegia.
So I'll move on now to um, uh, aortic infections. Uh, this is just a classification of aortic infections, mycotic aneurysms, microbial arteritis, and infection of an existing aneurysm. Um, although salmonella is uh, commonly talked about as being an important and the most common bug uh, with regards to bacteriology uh, of these infections, actually in our own institution, I don't think this is unusual. MRSA is really the, the bad bug that we're seeing now uh, in this regard. Uh, this is a, a paper that uh, Dr. Liu, who was a fellow here uh, at UCLA, as well as a uh, resident research fellow with us uh, a number of years ago, uh, put together looking at our early experience with using endovascular management uh, of, these, uh, of this problem. Uh, we found uh, in, in patients where we could actually isolate the bacteria, MRSA was present in every single case. Um, and uh, antipodic treatment was instituted at, di at diagnosis, obviously, and continued uh, 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 on a prolonged basis uh, for uh, most of the patients. Um, four in the thoracic aorta, three in the thoracoabdominal area, aorta, and two in the inferior aorta. And six of the nine were associated with an aerodigestive fistula, which is uh, really, a, a really a bad actor in this particular group of patients. Uh, mortality was about 50% over the long term. Um, we had three deaths in uh, the three of these, we had four deaths. One was from existing metastatic esophageal cancer, but the other three deaths were really a persistence of the uh, septic focus within the aorta. Uh, this is a large study, uh, Con did uh, back uh, in 2007, a review of 48 patients looking at endovascular, um, endovascular uh, uh, treatment, uh, 30-day, 10% uh, mortality, late 15%, uh, significant percentage of aortic enteric uh, fistulas uh, were present uh, in this group, and mortality was high in the long term. Um, and it, this is another study by Clue uh, looking at survival, and as you can see, five-year survival is 29%, and all deaths were related to aneurysm infection. So given that, it's, I think that uh, as far as endovascular management of this particular difficult problem, it is a bridge. It is not a definitive therapy. Um, the outcomes are varied. Uh, they certainly can stabilize the patient with the endovascular repair, but at some point you're going to need to do a definitive repair if the patient uh, uh, is, uh, is, is able to undergo it. Uh, and long-term antibiotic therapy is absolutely critical in this particular problem. Thank you. That was very quick, but uh, it's a lot of fun.